Hello everyone and welcome to The Biggest Ideas in the Universe. This is one of our Q&A sessions. I'm your host Sean Carroll and today we're going to be doing a Q&A associated with idea number three, force, energy, and action. So as I go through these Q&A videos, I am moving away more and more from the idea of specifically going down question by question and more and more toward a theory of uh, using the questions to inspire me to elaborate on things that maybe I glossed over or simply forgot to talk about when I did the original video. This is the downside of having a very casual, non-polished, non-rehearsed approach is that sometimes there are things I wanted to say and I just forgot to say them. Also, in this q and I'm going to use the opportunity, a few people have asked how I actually make the videos. So I will be at the end of this Q&A talking a little bit about the setup and the technology that goes into actually making the videos, if you want to stick around for that. I thought I would stick it at the end because many of you couldn't care less. So clean up. In other words, uh, what are the things that I didn't talk about in the actual video that I want to talk about? The, the most important thing is nothing very profound that I have to say. But remember, we were talking about the Newtonian versus Laplacian paradigms, right? So here is a particle at some point x. Uh, this is x naught, not zero equals naught. That was another question that was helpfully answered. Naught is just a way of saying zero. And t naught, okay? And then at some other time, t1, the particles located at x1. And in the least action way of doing things, we say of all the paths you could traverse between x0 and x1 and between time t0 and t1, what is the one that minimizes this quantity called the action? And all I wanted to do was to sort of highlight the question, how does it know? <laughs> this is the big issue with the miraculous feeling that we have about the principle of least action. You know, so we're saying that I don't tell you the initial velocity of the particle. I don't tell you the final velocity. I just tell you where it starts and when it ends. I tell you when it starts and when it ends. And somehow the procedure for figuring out all of the different ways of getting from here to there is that had I gone on another path that is not the actual physical one, the action this quantity that we defined, action, is uh, an integral, if that's okay, the sum over all the different moments of time of kinetic minus potential energies over time. Okay, so, and then you minimize the action, you get the least action to get the actual path. <sighs> It seems like precognition is going on here, right? It seems like the particle leaves at point x0 at time t0, and it immediately has a velocity, right? Like there's some velocity that the particle actually has right at that moment. And following that velocity in the Newtonian paradigm, we would say at every moment we chug forward using f equals ma, and we get to the final point. But in this picture, we say, well, it could have taken other paths. It could have gone in other velocities and done other things. But then the, this integrated quantity called the action would have been higher. So it didn't take those. It took the one with the least action, even though the action is this non-local quantity, this quantity that can only be evaluated by already knowing what the path is, right? How did it know what, what to do? So I don't want to, there's no answer to this in a simple way. Uh, it's just to point out that the question is badly phrased. You know, it didn't know. The particle didn't guess. The particle doesn't think about every single path ahead of time and then choose to go on the path of least action. There is a way the particle moves, and that way can be specified by saying of all the paths, it is the one with the least action. So one way of thinking about this is, you know, I said in words that minimizing the action gives us the same path as the Newtonian way of doing things, starting with F equals ma, but it's more specific than that. So let me talk about minimizing a path. What does it mean to minimize something? Minimize the action. Minimize uh, in, in math terms, how do we find the minimum of any function, okay? So let's imagine we have a much simpler function, f of x as a function of x. So this is not x the position, this is just x some variable, we don't know what it is, and someone has a function that does something like this. 
how do we know where the minimum of that function is? Well, you can see it. There it is. You and I can see it just by looking, but math can't see it or a computer can't see it. How would we mathematically figure out where the minimum is? Uh, again, I should have said this a long time ago, but the point is we know that the slope of that curve is the derivative, the change in f as we change x. And the point about the minimum is that at the minimum, the slope df dx equals zero. That's the mathematical way of saying where the minimum is. The minimum is the point, if it's a minimum, then at the minimum, the slope is zero. So the derivative is zero. So to solve for the minimum mathematically, you take the function f, you differentiate it, you find its derivative, you set the derivative equal to zero, and then you solve that equation. That's an equation, some expression in terms of x, the whole thing equals zero, you solve it, you find the minimum. So that is what you do up here, of course, for the least action principle, you take the action, but the action is not a function of one variable like x. It's a function of all the different paths you could go on, right? Here's another path you could have gone on. So you have to do a much more complicated integral. This is the subject called the calculus of variations. The idea that you have an infinite dimensional space, the space of all possible paths, but nevertheless, you can find one path and then take the derivative of some quantity like the action as you change the path by a little bit. In fact, the mathematically rigorous way to define it is to basically turn that infinite dimensional thing into a finite dimensional thing where you just change the path in one direction at a time and set that equal to zero everywhere. So you can do this little bit of calculus, this little bit right here. Look at this, I'm learning to change colors. So this little bit of calculus can be done on the space of all paths, not just on individual curves. So that's how you find the path of least action. But then the way that we do this, how do we, th there's a cute mathematical way of um, letting you know that we're differentiating with respect to an infinite dimensional thing rather than a finite dimensional thing, which is that rather than using the letter D for derivative, we use the Greek letter delta, the lowercase delta. So the functional derivative, as we call it, of the action is written ds, s is the action, I don't know if I said that, I don't know, again, why is the letter s used, there's probably some reason, lost to history, but ds, and I'm, I'm not going to, delta s rather, delta path, so for path, I was going to write the word path, but that's a little bit too casual even for me, let me write x of t, okay, this is a fancy language for simply saying we differentiate with respect to all possible paths, that number called the action, we set that equal to zero. And the point is, we get an equation, okay? We get an equation, and that equation turns exactly into Newton's laws. That's how you prove the equivalence between the least action way of doing classical mechanics and the Newtonian way of doing classical mechanics. You have this formalism that sounds very abstract. You have all these paths and infinite dimensional space of all the different possible paths. You figure out how to differentiate with them. There's a lot of math involved. You take math classes, good for you. But at the end, the equation that comes out from minimizing the action is the statement that at every single point along the trajectory, the particle obeys Newton's laws of motion, okay? So that's a way of easing your anxiety about the fact that the particle seems to know ahead of time which path to take. It's not that it thinks about every single path and chooses the right one, it's that the condition that follow that the path you follow be the least action one is the same as the condition that you're obeying Newton's laws at every moment. Okay, that's one thing to keep in mind. Here's another thing that you're probably thinking already as you watch me write these things. Um, sure, the minimum of this function has the feature that its derivative is zero, but guess what? A point where the function is a local maximum also has that feature where the slope is exactly zero. So the condition that the action have zero derivative, zero slope in the space of all possible paths, doesn't pick out the minimum uniquely. It just says, 
it's a place where the function isn't changing instantaneously, momentarily. It could be a minimum or a maximum or in higher numbers of dimensions. It could be what we call a critical point where in some directions uh, it could be going down, in other directions it could be going up, but it's momentarily stationary. So sometimes this is called a saddle point. If you think of literally a saddle that is sort of this kind of shape in two dimensions, right? then if you, you're right here, you're at a critical point where everything is flat, you're at a flat location on the surface, but in this direction, things are going up, in this direction, things are going down, right? So you're at a mixed point where in some directions it's up, some directions it's down, but momentarily everything is flat. How do you know that the actual path you're going to take is not just some extremum, some maximum or some critical point rather than the minimum? The answer is you don't. You don't know that. In fact, that's fine. A path where the action was locally maximized would be a perfectly good solution to the equations of motion. The problem is that's what not what appears in nature. And the reason why is you can easily make the action infinitely big, right? Just like jiggle infinitely fast, very, very, very quickly on very, very small time scales, you can get as big of an action as you want. It's kinetic minus potential. Just make your kinetic energy really, really big. So Practically, there is no such thing as a maximum of the action. It can be infinitely big. There is such a thing as a minimum at some finite value. That's where the actual paths are. That's why it's the principle of least action, not just the principle of stationary action. But in principle, as it were, the principle could say any, any point where delta s delta path equals zero is a perfectly good solution to the equations of motion, formally speaking. This also leads us to the following idea. Um, even if you can rule out maxima, you can certainly have functions where, here's another function f of x versus x. What if I have a function that looks like this? Where there's lots of minima locally. There's that sort of, I didn't draw it very well, but probably this point is the actual minimum, but this point and this point and this point all seem to be minima locally, right? You're in the bottom of a little valley, and in fact, at every one of these points, df dx equals zero, there and there and there and there and there. So I can draw a zero better than that, I think. So what about those points? You know, can we imagine that we might live there? Um, yeah, you can. In fact, that's no problem whatsoever. Think about a particle in a box. So here is, now this is not space-time anymore. This is space and space. So here's X and Y, okay? A box, two-dimensional box. And I have a particle that starts here. So this is X naught at time T naught. And I say I want the particle to get to here, point X one at time T one, okay? And maybe Y is also different for these two different things. So clearly, there is going to be a path that looks like this. You just go straight across, and you go at some velocity. So given that when you leave, you leave at time t0, and when you arrive, you arrive at time t1, there will be a correct velocity. So the principle of least action will find that correct velocity for you. It will tell you how fast you need to go from there to there. But that's not the only path that would get you there. If you went more quickly than that path, you would not go there because you would reach there and then bounce back by the time you reach T1. If you went more slowly, you wouldn't get there in time. But you can bounce off the wall at the correct angle, so this could be your path. If you move a little quickly, it's a little farther path, but if you move more quickly, so you have a higher initial velocity than the yellow path, put an arrow on the yellow path also, then that orange path is perfectly allowed. That is something that could start you at x0 at t0 and get you to x1 at t1. What's wrong with that? Well, the answer is nothing is wrong with that. That's a perfectly good path, and the principle of least action allows you to take it. So that is exactly this situation. This yellow path is one of the points, which is a minimum of the action. This orange path is another local minimum of the action. So the set of trajectories that satisfies delta s delta path equals zero, those give you all the allowed paths, and they would all be found by this method. 
So you see that there's a little bit, that's a little bit of a disadvantage maybe to the principle of least action versus the Newtonian Laplacian way of doing things. Um, the Newtonian Laplacian way of doing things gives you a unique answer, almost always. There's some tiny little uh, caveats to that, which we may get to later. But starting from a single point with a single position and a single momentum, you just chug forward in time and you get a unique answer. Minimizing the action between two points at two different times could give you multiple answers. Maybe you consider that a bad feature because you don't get a unique answer, but maybe it's good because you get a whole bunch of good plausible answers. That's just how it is. That is allowed completely consistent by the principle of least action. Um, good, I did that, I did that. So. The last thing I wanted to mention sort of as a, in a cleanup vein is how much information is required. Oops. Because I said that it was the same amount in the Newtonian point of view versus the least action point of view. So if this is x and this is t again, one way of doing it is you start here. This is t naught. This is t1. Not a very well drawn T1, sorry about that. So you say you end there, this is x1, comma t1, x naught, comma t naught. And I said, look, in the Newtonian way, you would give me x naught and p naught at this initial time. In the least action way, you would give me x naught and x1, okay? So you give me the initial location and the final location, you don't give me any velocities or any momenta at all, so I said it's an equal amount of information. This looks like a one-dimensional line that the particle lives on, but if it lived in three dimensions, there'd be three pieces of information, three dimensions for the position, and also three for the momentum, so it still matches in both cases. But uh, the question was asked, yes, but what about the time? It looks like here, you give me t naught, and here you give me both T naught and T one. So that doesn't look quite fair. I get what you're saying, but it's not really uh, an issue. Of course, in the Newtonian point of view, you start with X naught, P naught, and then you get the entire path at all times. In the least action point of view, you get between T naught and T one, but I could, all, I could still ask the question from the Newtonian point of view, given X naught and P naught, given my starting position and velocity, where would I end up at T1? If I started at T0, where would I end up at T1? That is the question being answered by that point of view. And the least action principle, that process, formalism, answers the same question. Given I started X0 at T0, and I want to end up at X1 at T1, what is the path I take in between? So secretly, it is exactly the same amount of information either way. Don't worry about that. Okay. Now we get into more specific questions um, that were asked in various places. You can ask questions either in the YouTube video or on the blog. You can try to ask questions on Twitter, but I might forget them. It might, might be hard to trace down. When I mention the blog, by the way, um, I'm embedding all these videos at preposterousuniverse.com slash blog. This is my blog that I've kept for many, many years. Right now I'm using it as a place to put these videos. So you can ask questions there. There is actually the best place to ask because there's many more comments on YouTube that are not just questions. Okay, so here's a question. Why, this is the kind of question I like people asking. Why uh, is the action S equal to the integral of kinetic minus potential energy? Oops. And in particular, the kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Potential energy is just some function v of x. Why is that the action rather than something else? So the glib and completely 100% true answer is that's what works. That is the formula that actually gives us the behavior of particles in the real world for particles like a point ball rolling down a hill or something like that, okay? Um, but, you, but what you're really asking then is, well, is there any principled reason why I couldn't consider other things? Why I couldn't consider the velocity cubed or the velocity times the position or something like that? Oh, but the answer is those would give you different laws of physics. This is the form of the action that gives you Newton's laws, F equals MA, and then the various definitions of what you mean by F for the electromagnetic force or for the gravitational force or whatever. This is the right kind of 
action. But you're allowed to consider other kinds of action. In fact, let me tell you, let me like reveal you a secret, not really a secret, let me reveal you a true fact that is well ahead of where we are in this discussion. Um, one of the interesting things about this least action way of doing it, one of the reasons why it's interesting, even though at the end of the day it just gives you back Newton's laws, is that when you get to more advanced, more complicated, more subtle theories of physics, like we have in quantum field theory, it becomes much easier to write down an action than it does to write down equations of motion. And I can tell you why that is. Um, so here we wrote down the action as kinetic energy minus potential energy for a particle moving along a line. Um, we will later on, God willing, um, be later talking about field theory. So rather than talking about a particle at some position, uh, here is space, and this is time again. Remember, always label your axes. There's so many professional scientists who will draw plots and they know what the axes are, but they don't tell you. So give me a hard time if I don't label the axes. In field theory, the fundamental objects are not particles with locations. They are fields like phi, is a typical Greek letter that we use for a field, and phi has a value at every point in space and at every moment of time. So there's phi at that location, phi at this location over here, etc. It's a, it's a that's what a field is. Unlike a particle, it is defined by where it is. A field is everywhere, but it's defined by how big it is at every single point. So, something like this formula we have for the kinetic energy minus the potential energy seems not up to the task because it, it's a function of x and v, the position and velocity. Whereas here we can work with phi which is itself a function of position and time. And we can also work with various derivatives of phi. So we can work with the what we call the partial derivative. This is, sorry, too much math here, but now that phi depends on both space and time, rather than just saying the derivative of phi, we have to say the derivative of phi with respect to space and the derivative of phi with respect to time, etc. And so we use these weird curly Ds, I think that it was Leibniz who invented these, to let you know that we're doing a partial derivative, a derivative in one particular direction at a time in space-time. So we have a whole bunch of things that we can work at, and every single one of these is a function of both space and time. So the reason why this works so nicely in field theory is the action S is given by, in our old formula, in our good way of doing it, the integral of something called the Lagrangian. So we wrote kinetic minus potential, and that was a particular form. But this function, kinetic energy minus potential energy, is what is called the Lagrangian. And that was for a point particle. It looks like I've written POH, but I really haven't. Potential. Um, in field theory, the Lagrangian itself, L, is going to be an integral of some function some function of space over all of space so at every point in space i take these quantities the field and its derivatives i construct some function i multiply the field together i multiply the derivatives of the field together i do all these things that i want to do and then I integrate over all of space, call that the Lagrangian, and then I integrate over all of time, the Lagrangian, and I call that the action. So this function is called the Lagrange density, but because we are always lazy and because we literally are always working with the Lagrange density, we just call the Lagrange density the Lagrangian. So the technical careful thing is that the Lagrangian is the thing you put and integrate over time to get the action. The Lagrange density is the thing you integrate over all of space to get the Lagrangian, but we actually just use the terminology informally that the Lagrange density we call the Lagrangian. So the point is, all of this is to say, the Lagrangian to a particle physicist, to a quantum field theorist, oops, yeah, I had it right, Lagrangian, 
curly L, it is often written, and it is a function of phi and its derivatives. The derivative of phi with respect to space, derivative of phi with respect to time, and also the derivative of other fields, because there's more than one field in the world, right? So maybe you have a field psi. I don't want to call it psi because that's the quantum wave function. That gets confusing. Eta is a field. And eta has derivatives with respect to space, and eta has derivatives with respect to time. And there's a large number of fields and their derivatives, okay? So Lagrangian is a function of many, many things. But it's just one function. It's just one particular combination of all those different fields. If you have a huge collection of fields, then if you just wrote down Newtonian looking equation of motion, every field would have its own independent equation of motion. Whereas in the Lagrangian way of doing things, you take all the fields, you combine them into some function to make a Lagrangian, you calculate from that Lagrangian the action, you minimize the action. Where'd it go? Delta s equals zero, right? There you go. You minimize this action, and that's all of your equations of motion because you're minimizing it with respect to field one, phi, and then field two, eta, and then field three, omega, or whatever it is. You separately minimize this function, the action, with respect to all the fields, and all of those separate minimizations give you different equations of motion. So if you go down here, what you would say is that delta s delta phi equals zero, delta s delta eta equals zero, dot, dot, dot. So from one function, the Lagrangian, you get all the different equations of motion. That's an enormous increase in simplicity and power. And so what that means is when you're guessing new theories of nature, when you're being a modern particle physicist or quantum field theorist, the thing that you're doing is writing down new Lagrangians. You're inventing new fields and you're inventing new ways for them to interact with each other. If you talk about the Higgs boson, what did Higgs and his friends, Anglaire and Brout and others actually do? They wrote down a new Lagrangian for a new field. And they showed that this new Lagrangian would lead to certain new features of the world, like breaking of symmetries and things like that. And then many years later, that actual prediction that there was a particle associated with that field was discovered in the Large Hadron Collider. So one of the reasons why Lagrangians and therefore actions are so important is that the job of the modern quantum field theorist is to write down the right Lagrangian of the world, at least to the extent that quantum field theory is the right description of the world. So far we think it is, but there's some hints from gravity and other things that maybe it's not complete. But anyway, this is how modern cutting edge field theorists think. They think in terms of Lagrangians. That's what I wanted you to know. So sorry about, you know, this got mathy. Sorry about that. I don't want to get too mathy. The point is the least action principle is not just a cool twist on Newtonian mechanics. It's an extraordinarily powerful tool in modern physics. So we use it all the time. Um, there's another reason, I'm not going to go into it too much right now, but the other reason why Lagrangians and, and the action are great is because they let you implement symmetries very, very simply. Uh, if you have symmetries like, remember, Galilean invariance, right? It doesn't matter where you are or how fast you're moving. You can write down Lagrangians that respect those symmetries, and then the equations of motion will respect them automatically. So again, just because this single function Lagrangian is a much simpler thing than a long list of equations of motion, it's a much more compact, powerful way of thinking. Okay, another question was um, quantum mechanics. Because look, when I'm drawing <laughs> pictures like this, which I've now drawn over and over again, x, t, point, point, path, but then also other paths, there's another path, there's another path, okay? Many, many little paths doing different things. That's the picture that you draw associated with the principle of least action. And then the thing that you say is, the, there's only one of those actual paths that is taken, the one where the min action is minimized. But you've probably heard of Feynman, Richard Feynman, sum over histories. What Feynman realized was that in quantum mechanics, 
You know, in quantum mechanics, what we talk about in the traditional way of talking about it is forget about particles, forget about positions. We have a wave function, Schrodinger's wave function, and we evolve it forward or backward in time. Those of you who are not familiar, buy my book, Something Deeply Hidden. I'll write that down. Something Deeply Hidden. You can read about this. Ah, but I have to write the word correctly. My own book, right? Something. To be honest, uh, I think that the sum over histories is only mentioned very, very briefly. I don't try to explain it in this book. But quantum mechanics and wave functions, the traditional way of doing it, I definitely do explain at great length. So if you want the traditional way, read that book. The sum over histories way is, you know, even though what we care about is the wave function, let's pretend that what we care about is a particle, okay? Let's care about the, let's, let's pretend there really is a particle. Let's pretend the particle really has a location in space as a function of time. And let's pretend that there's all these different paths it could take. And let's say, let's imagine that, because it's now quantum mechanics, not classical mechanics, that it takes all of the paths. That the actual quantum evolution of the particle is that all of these paths are actually taken. But when we take all these paths, what we do is we calculate not the act, we calculate the action to, to all those paths, but we're not done yet. We don't just minimize the action. We add up a contribution, and again, this is a little uh, more math than you need. We, we write down a contribution, e, the number e, to the power i, the square root of minus 1, times the action. This is the number that we integrate over all paths. We sum them up. That's what sum means. Integral and sum are the same thing. An integral is just a continuous version of the discrete sum. So this is an integral over all paths of this number, e to the i times the action. And what this means is that when the action is near a minimum, right, when it's near its location that is classically allowed, the least action path, paths that are almost a least action path, but not quite, will give almost the same action. Right? If, it's, if the derivative of the path of the action is zero, that means that nearby paths have almost the same action. So near the classical path, this number s is almost the same for nearby paths, and therefore when you add them up, they constructively interfere. They give you the same kind of contribution. But this number, e to the i s, it's a complex number. So it has a real part, an imaginary part, both the real part and the imaginary part can be either positive or negative. So once you get far away from the real true classical paths, even paths that are very nearby each other can have wildly different actions. And because they have wildly different actions, typically when you add up e to the i times the action, you'll get a big positive number from one path and a big negative number from another path. They will destructively interfere. So what Feynman says is that in quantum mechanics, you actually can imagine the particle taking all the paths, but the classical paths count more, or to say that slightly more rigorously and accurately, the set of all paths near the classical path count more than the set of all paths far away from the classical path. And one way of interpreting this is the particle probably did what it did classically or near to classically, but there is a probability that the particle does something very surprising. This is exactly the relationship of Feynman's sum over histories to ordinary quantum mechanics using the Schrodinger equation is exactly the same as the relationship between the principle of least action in classical mechanics and Newtonian way of doing classical mechanics. Namely, they do exactly the same predictions. There is no empirical difference. They are two different formalisms that give you exactly the same physical theory, just two different sets of words assigned to the same phenomena. So it's not that one is right and one is wrong, but you can get insight from thinking about things in different ways. Just like I said, you can get insight. It's a powerful formalism to use actions and Lagrangians in quantum field theory rather than a Newtonian way of doing it. You can get insight from thinking about transitions between different quantum states from a sum over histories perspective rather than a Schrodinger equation perspective. So it is not a mistake. It is not an accident. It is not a coincidence that the pictures we drew when we explained the principle of least action are the same pictures you draw when you draw Feynman's sum over histories. In a way, I mean, when Feynman himself tells it, 
This is kind of what he was inspired to think of from Dirac. Dirac was the first to use the action formalism at all in quantum mechanics, but he didn't quite go all the way. And Feynman said, can we think about this as, you know, all the pads? And Dirac said, yeah, you can try. And then he did, and he invented this. So it's a very nice way of thinking about things. Okay, that was one legit question. Very, very good question. Um, another one is, uh, you know, so phase space, I said... The space of all initial conditions, right? The space of all the data you have to tell me to what to, to know what the particle is going to do next is the space of positions and momenta. Okay, so people say, well, what about things like the mass of the particle, or the charge of the particle, or other parameters, the spin, something like that? Okay, there are certainly other features that you need to know. And this is certainly true. I mean, that's absolutely correct. If you're in an electric field, for example, if you have an electric field pointing this way, here's an electric field pointing up, okay? And you have a particle here that has charge Q, and Q is greater than zero. So you have a positively charged particle. That particle will start accelerating. It will feel a force going upward. If you have another particle, I'll make it another color, if at the same location, I'm not going to draw it at the same location, but in the same mag electric field, with the same magnitude of charge, but a negative amount, okay, a minus charge. Um, oops, I should have drawn that better than this. Then that will also feel a force, but the force will be in the other direction, okay? So two particles at exactly the same position with exactly the same momentum can be pushed in different directions and therefore travel on different paths depending on what their electric charge is. Likewise, the mass of the particle will affect its acceleration and so forth. So yes, you need all of those numbers, the mass and the charge, and etc., to give me the information I need to chug forward in time and solve the equations and get what trajectory is actually taken. But when I say that uh, the force acting on some particle depends on the positions and the velocities the, or the momenta of all the other particles, the way it depends depends on the masses and the forces, etc. So secretly, I might, you know, imagine that built into this function is knowledge of what the masses and charges, etc. are. So it's a sloppy way of talking. I absolutely agree to that, and there's no defense for it, but it's something that, you know, I should have noticed, but is built in uh, once you're a practicing physicist, the phase space things, the position and the momenta, those describe the same system, but in different configurations, in different ways of starting out. If you change the mass or the charge, then you're describing a different system, right? So when we say that the phase space is the set of all possibilities, we mean for that specific system. And we look at physics sort of one kind of system versus another kind of system. And when we say that the phase space is all the different ways the system can go, we're keeping the parameters of the system fixed. So you're absolutely right. You need to understand what the masses and charges are, but implicitly I'm building that into what I count as the laws of physics in this particular case. So I don't know if that's a, a satisfying answer, but that is the answer. That is what we mean. Okay, uh, final substantive question is, what about the Higgs boson? I just mentioned it, the Higgs field. So you may have heard that there's something called the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson is a little vibration in the Higgs field. The whole point, we're, maybe we'll get there, I don't know, but all of space is suffused with this invisible energy field called the Higgs field. And you may have heard that interactions with that field give particles mass. So I said that there are things like the, uh, here's a particle with a mass. There's the gravitational mass, there's the inertial mass, and so forth. There's different notions of mass. The question is, where does the Higgs come in? Is that a different kind of mass? Would we not have F equals MA if it wasn't for the Higgs field, right? So the answer is, the Higgs field determines the masses of certain particles. In fact, determines masses of, or affects anyway, influences the masses of elementary particles. And this is important. What I mean by that is, you know, the electron, uh, quarks, things like that. So if the Higgs boson was not a field pervading all of space, the values of 
the mass of the electron, the mass of the up quark, the mass of the muon, etc., would be different values. There would still be something called mass. It's just the value of the mass would be different. In particular, if it was empty space, but you remove the Higgs field, uh, the electron would somehow have zero mass. It'd be a massless particle. But it's not that the Higgs field has anything fundamentally to do with the nature of mass, the essence of mass. Newton didn't need to know about the Higgs field to talk about mass, nor did the introduction of the Higgs field uh, centuries later change what we meant by mass. It just changes the value. It helps determine the value in the actual standard model of particle physics. Now, that's in fact only true for elementary particles. So you and I, right, we're made of atoms. So we have, roughly speaking, here are protons and neutrons, okay? So maybe this is an atom, some protons and neutrons. And then there are electrons going around it, and we will later argue this is a terrible picture because it ignores quantum mechanics, but okay. Uh, we'll give it more electrons. We'll give it three electrons to make it electrically neutral. The protons and neutrons in your body are way heavier, like almost 2,000 times heavier. The mass of a proton, I'm not going to get it exactly right. The mass of a proton in cosmologist units, the mass of the proton is approximately the same as the mass of a neutron, which is approximately 1,800 times the mass of an electron. So protons and neutrons are way heavier than electrons are. Most of your mass comes from protons and neutrons. But Protons and neutrons are made of quarks. So proton equals two up quarks and one down quark. Whereas a neutron equals one up quark and two down quarks. And you can uh, go home and try to figure out, therefore, what are the electrical charges of the up quark and the down quark? The answer is an up quark is plus two thirds. The down quark is minus one third. This works out, okay? Um, but interestingly, the up quark and down quark are nowhere near one third of the mass of the proton and the neutron. You might think the mass of the proton is approximately the same as the mass of the neutron. They're both made of three quarks. The masses must be one third each. That's not true. The mass of the, of the up quark and down quark turn out to be much less than the mass of the proton and neutron. How can that be possible? So the up quark and down quark get their mass from the Higgs field, but the up quark and down quark are not where the mass of the proton or neutron come from. Why not? The answer is, this is complicated, I'm not gonna do the whole thing, but the individual quarks have a color. This is their version of electric charge. They have a color charge. And it's just like the electron and the proton pull each other in the atom because of electromagnetism. The quarks pull on each other inside the proton and neutron because of the color force, QCD, quantum chromodynamics. But the difference is an electron all by itself has an electric field that radiates to infinity. And it, that electric field has energy in it but it's a lot of energy when you're near the electron and very, very little energy when you're far away. If you had a single quark all by itself in the universe, it would have a color field around it that would contain an infinite amount of energy. This is why you don't ever have a single quark all by itself in the universe, because quarks are confined. Quarks can only exist inside protons and neutrons and other versions of them, baryons and mesons, hadrons. Um, so the reason why is because if you have multiple quarks, their fields can cancel each other out very, very far away. In fact, the color fields of the quarks in a proton cancel each other out very quickly once you get far away from the proton. So their, their energy, the energy contained in the color fields, goes to zero very, very quickly. But you're left with a little ball called the proton, which has these little tiny dots in it called quarks, and a whole bunch of leftover color force and energy. Most of the energy inside a proton comes from the energy in the color field, not the individual quarks. That's very different from an atom. In an atom, there is energy that comes from the electromagnetic field that, contain, that, that holds an electron to a proton, but that amount of energy is negligible compared to the mass of the electrons and protons themselves. For the proton, it's the other way around. Most of the energy 
and therefore most of the mass of the proton comes from its color fields. And that has nothing to do with the Higgs boson whatsoever. It's a completely different phenomenon. So even though most of the mass of elementary particles comes from the Higgs ultimately, most of your mass does not. Most of your mass comes from QCD, quantum chromodynamics, the color charge that holds the quarks together in the proton and the neutron. That's the relationship, such as it is, between the mass within the Higgs and the mass of other things. We'll probably say all this again in a later video. Okay, that's all I had for the physics questions. I had a very brief um, introduction to how I actually make these videos. You know, I'm still learning. I'm still trying to be better at it. So uh, the simple thing is, it, none of this is simple. I'm sure there's a simpler way of doing this than what I do it, than how I do it. So I have a program called Camtasia, which does two things. It captures video from the computer screen. Oops, I can do better than that. So I have a laptop, which is a Mac. And I can have images on the laptop and Camtasia can capture them in video form, okay. And it also lets me edit. It's a simple video edit editor. So I can cut and snip and things like that and also green screen out. So Camtasia is good for that. It, it, that's what I wanted. I wanted something that could capture from the screen and also could get rid of the green screen behind me. Camtasia does that. Um, sim very, very simple audio editing features and color editing features, things like that. Um, now, ideally, that would be almost everything, right? Uh, I need to be able to get the things that I'm writing here on the pad onto the screen somehow. So I have an iPad, iPad, with a program called Notability and Pencil, Apple Pencil, as I mentioned. I don't know why they don't call it a pen, but they call it the Apple Pencil. Um, so that's how I'm writing on this pad. Here it is. Here's the iPad that I'm writing on. Um, oops, by changing it, my screen switched. Um, so I, I can write on here, I can take notes. I use a program called Notes Plus when I'm actually taking notes or doing calculations or things like that. I use that for the first few videos, but it doesn't have this dark mode capability. It doesn't have this dark background. So Notability, as opposed to Notes Plus, has this dark background. It's otherwise a very similar uh, kind of arrangement. So what I need to do is to get the thing I write on the iPad to the screen of my laptop so that Camtasia can capture it. That's simpler than it looks, actually. It's just QuickTime. So QuickTime, which you already have, if you have uh, a Mac, and I'm sure there's some Windows version or Linux version or whatever, QuickTime Player, you can fire that up, and there will be an option, New Movie Recording, and you click on New Movie Recording, and the default is it looks through your webcam to try to record a movie, but you can change that default to capture from your iPad. So in principle, you could do that over wireless or Bluetooth. I use an actual cord to do it because I don't, I use a wire. I don't trust the wireless for this. But the point is there can be a window on my laptop that is mirroring what's happening on my iPad. Camtasia can capture that. Simultaneously, Camtasia can capture what is happening on my webcam. Part of the reason why the early videos were not as good in terms of color and, and focus and things like that is because the webcam was just not up to it. And it's not just the, my computer webcam. I had a fancier webcam that was external, but it still wasn't up to it. So eventually I switched to using a Canon camcorder, Vixia camcorder. And so I used that to actually make the videos. Um, and then I just import them separately. And it's a pain in the butt. But I love you folks so much, I'm willing to do it for you. So I need to separately import the video uh, using these little flash drives um, to the computer and then read them into Camtasia and then sync up the audio and stuff like that. But that's very doable. I'm kind of used to doing equivalent things from doing the podcast. Okay. Um, I made a mistake and I got a camcorder that does not have remote control. So I have to walk over it and push the button and then come back. But that's a, that, that's a minor thing. Um, and then I also have a separate uh, microphone because I'm a podcaster. I have a podcast, Mindscape. You should all check it out. So I have a fancy um, 
podcasting microphone, way more than I need. Here it is. This is an Electro Voice RE320 microphone that I take the audio in. I think that the audio quality is probably less important for YouTube videos than for podcasts, but that's okay. I can use that. It goes right in. There's a little machine that brings it in from that to the computer, but that's okay. Camtasia can uh, bring that in perfectly well. Okay. Um, and then I put it all together, uh, and that works. I think that's all the software I'm using. The other question is um, the actual physical studio setup. So, um, studio. Here it is. One of these directions, over my left shoulder, right shoulder, I don't know, because what I'm going to do is, as I'm editing this video, I'm going to use Camtasia to import a picture of the studio setup. So it's not a very complicated studio setup. It's my office. I don't have a lot of room. But what I did was I went to Sammy's camera, um, Sammy's with one M, which is a chain that has stores in uh, throughout California. There's one in Pasadena near Caltech. So. I had no idea what I was doing. I knew that I wanted to do these videos with a green screen. And honestly, I don't need the green screen. I could just do it in my office, but I need to keep myself entertained <laughs> somehow. So I thought that'd be a fun extra thing to learn. So I went in to Sammy's camera and I explained what I wanted to do. And there was a woman working there who had been a portrait photographer and she knew exactly what I was talking about. And she said, well, you need this and this and this. And you know, you see these uh, lights with the umbrellas and everything and the green screen is pretty big. And I needed a big setup, a pole to hang the green screen on. I'm like, wow, this is way more than I thought it was gonna be. She explained all why I would need it and she turned out to be completely correct. So. I kind of didn't believe her, but you know, as you know, the video quality has improved over the past few videos because I was learning more and more about the lighting setup. You have to light the green screen brightly without lighting yourself too brightly, um, but you have to light yourself so you don't look pink or anything like that. And it turned out that what I eventually learned by trial and error is what she was trying to tell me all along. So I'm sorry I forgot your name, person from Sammy's camera who helped me out, but um, I, I went there literally like three days before we went into lockdown here in Los Angeles and the store closed. So after we already knew, after restaurants had already closed, but before other stores had closed, uh, I didn't trust myself to buy things correctly on the internet. I wanted to talk to a real person. So I went there and she told me what to buy and I just decided to accept her wisdom there and I bought it. And so it's turning out pretty well. Um, there, yeah, there's a lot of tricks there. Like not only do I have to worry about what color I'm wearing, but um, so if I wore green, obviously that would be bad. But I've been on, you know, uh, videos before. I've been on, you know, Nova and the History Channel and uh, Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman. And when you're on green screen, they tell you not to wear black. And I never quite understood that. But uh, now I get it. Like somehow it's not that black is the same as green, but that the adjustment, there's an exposure adjustment that happens. If you're too dark, it overexposes the green behind you and becomes harder to remove, or at least that's my current interpretation of it. Um, so anyway, that's my setup. Am I, am I forgetting anything important here? You know, a bunch of little drives and, and everything. I'm still struggling with the fact that the videos are huge file sizes, like uh, 60 gigabytes is the Camtasia file. When it finally outputs an MP4 that I can upload to YouTube, it's smaller than that, but the working, you know, Camtasia format is really, really big, and it, I don't think it should be that big, and it's a struggle to put it on my computer uh, with the disk space, but I'm learning about that. Anyway, probably not many of you wanted to know that, but I'm glad someone asked. This is where I'm going to put it, so if anyone wants to know, they can look there. Uh, as I've said before, I hope you are enjoying it. I am enjoying making it. It's, uh, it takes time, but it's useful time. It's good to think about this stuff uh, and it's good to you know distract yourself a little bit. I, I, you know, I could just play video games or, or watch movies all day. This is enormously more rewarding than that. So thank you very much for watching.